Merle Haggard was born on April 6, 1937, into poverty. His family had moved to California during the Great Depression and set up home in a refurbished old boxcar. Things got even tougher, though, when Haggard's father James suddenly died in 1946 when Merle was just nine years old. Merle told Rolling Stone, something went out of my world that I was never able to replace. In his father's absence, Merle turned to music. His parents had never appreciated music, and his mother frowned upon entertainers. But Merle found himself sneaking into music halls to listen to the country stars of the day, like the Maddox brothers. Merle also turned to something else, crime. When he was 11, his fed-up mother turned him over to the authorities, calling him, quote, incorrigible. By his teens, he was a regular, frequently in and out of prison, and he often got out by escaping. Haggard once said he had escaped from jail some 17 times. Finally, in 1957, he ended up in San Quentin for robbery charges. While he was originally unsure how long he would be in prison, he ended up spending three years there before leaving. In his 2011 autobiography, My House of Memories, Haggard detailed one of the most transformative experiences of his life. A friend tried to entice him to make another jailbreak. This time, Haggard stayed put. The friend ended up killing a highway patrolman during the escape attempt and was sent to death row, then executed. Haggard, shaken, vowed to turn his life around. That wasn't the only transformative experience Haggard went through in prison. While still serving his sentence, he was one of a number of inmates who attended a live performance by country legend Johnny Cash inside the walls of San Quentin. Haggard was inspired. In My House of Memories, Haggard wrote that watching Johnny Cash made him a better man. He detailed how men at the prison were enthralled by Cash's presence on New Year's Day and were impressed with his performance, interacting enthusiastically with the musical icon. What really stood out to Haggard was the fact that Cash made a genuine effort to connect with the prisoners and was empathetic. Haggard later said, I didn't care for his music before that. I thought it was corny. But he had the crowd right in the palm of his hand. Later in life, the two became close friends. In fact, when Cash was dying, Haggard visited him in the hospital ICU wearing a doctor's coat. When Cash asked him why he was there, Haggard replied, quote, I'm here because I love you. After he left prison on parole in 1960, Merle Haggard decided to focus on the one thing that he'd been ignoring for a long time, music. When he wasn't working for his brother Lowell, he'd devote his Saturdays to music. Haggard wrote in his autobiography that he was simply trying to figure out what he could do in the music scene when something unexpected happened. A stranger, Jack Collier, showed up at his house and asked him whether he'd like to be part of a band, explaining that their frontman had accepted a different job and that they were looking to fill the position. Haggard immediately agreed. The group performed together four times a week, helping him to start his career in the music industry. Haggard wrote, That little gig was the beginning, and it went all the way from that to where I am today. Haggard would spend the next few years honing his music skills and working several gigs until he landed a spot with Capitol Records in the early 1960s. Haggard's first major hit was Sing a Sad Song, which hit number 19 on the Billboard Country Charts in January 1964. It didn't exactly make him a household name, but the song did set Haggard on his way to success. Haggard was married five times, with varying degrees of success. He and his first wife, Leona, had four children together during the course of their eight-year marriage, but they also fought all the time, and those fights often turned into physical abuse on both sides. According to reports, Leona once beat Merle in public, while on another occasion she jumped out of a moving car to avoid being hit by Haggard. Haggard said that a major issue in their marriage was the fact that while he was in San Quentin, Leona became pregnant with another man's child. He said the abuse reached a peak when, after his release, she began mocking him in front of her new lover. Haggard attacked her and began to strangle her. He said, I remember thinking in my mind, well, I know where I'll be going. I'll be going to death row, San Quentin. But I was so upset with her, then I came back to reality. 
They finally divorced in 1964, and Haggard went on to marry four more times. He credits his second wife, singer Bonnie Owens, for helping him with some of the biggest hits of his career. Though they divorced in 1978 after 13 years of marriage, she still continued to tour with him as his backup singer until her death in 2006. He married his fifth and final wife, Teresa Ann Lane, in 1993, and they remained married until Haggard's death in 2016, an event that hit her very hard. She later said, I'm just now picking myself up out of the dirt, and barely, I'm barely walking, because I lost my everything. He was my world. Merle Haggard reflected on his life through his music, including the tough parts like his time in prison and the experience of losing his father through songs like Mama Tried, Sing Me Back Home, and Branded Man. While he was initially reluctant to talk about his hard times, he opened up about his experiences after being encouraged by Johnny Cash, revealing on the Johnny Cash show that he did in fact have a prison record. Haggard had been worried that being an ex-con would destroy his career, but in Instead, it actually boosted his career because it showed viewers a unique side to the singer while cementing the fact that he was a real person singing from real, tough life experiences. Haggard later revealed, Johnny Cash once told me, Hag, you're the guy people think I am. Haggard became an outlaw country legend before outlaw country was even a thing, and that had a lot to do with the fact that he bucked industry trends and record label wishes by putting out some quite political and very controversial songs in the late 60s and early 70s. One of his biggest hits ever was Oki from Muskogee, a song which repudiated the hippie youth counterculture. It was embraced by the so-called silent majority of conservative middle Americans who supported Nixon and the Vietnam. Vietnam War. Haggard followed up the success of Oki from Muskogee with an even more overtly political song, The Fight Inside of Me, which essentially accused anti-war protesters of being anti-American as well. The anthems were wildly popular with conservatives and equally unpopular with liberals, but despite the strident messages of his songs, Haggard himself eventually grew ambivalent about how the tunes were received. He viewed Oki from Muskogee as less a song about about his own feelings and more an expression of what some of his countrymen were feeling. For instance, despite Oki from Muskogee famously disparaging marijuana usage, Haggard himself was a regular user. Oki from Muskogee is a, is a hit for other reasons, which I, a lot of them I'm not sure of. Just as Johnny Cash spent a lot of time playing free gigs at prisons for the inmates, Merle Haggard did too. Remembering the massive impact Cash's San Quentin appearance made on his life, Haggard returned to the prison where he once served time on multiple occasions and also performed at Fort Leavenworth, Huntsville, and several prisons for women. He told Rolling Stone that when it comes to putting on a prison concert, you just had to roll with what the audience wants and let them guide your performance. You kinda let them direct you. They sometimes are adamant about an area of your career that you might not even be aware of. They want something that you might have forgot about. They're in charge of the show, and they know it, and I let them know it. They just kinda help me along. Merle Haggard went through a rough patch in the 1980s, battling drug addiction. He wrote candidly in his memoir, My House of Memories, about this dark period of his life, in part because he wanted to be open and honest with his children about both his past and the dangers of drug abuse. I said early in this book that I reluctantly confess these things about myself, knowing my children will read them. I believe my kids know I wouldn't lie to them. Haggard's past unexpectedly became a hot-button topic again in 2015 when country singer Luke Bryan referenced Haggard's drug use in an interview, saying, I think that people who want Merle, Willie, and Waylon just need to buy Merle, Willie, and Waylon. I'm not an outlaw country singer. I don't do cocaine and run around, so I'm not going to sing outlaw country. Many fans were upset and attacked Bryan on social media prompting him to call Haggard's son Ben to apologize for bringing Merle into it. Despite the difficulties Haggard faced in the 80s with his addiction though, he cited a 1992 bankruptcy as the low point that really forced him to reevaluate how he was conducting his life and career. What really stuck home? He filed for bankruptcy on the same day that his fifth wife, Teresa, gave birth to their son, Binion. 
At the end of his life, Merle Haggard dealt with several health issues that prevented him from pursuing his passion for music. Despite that, he played whenever he could and tried to stay active as a musician. For instance, in early 2016, Haggard told Rolling Stone that he was optimistic and felt grateful that he was still alive after suffering through a serious bout of pneumonia. At 78, he was then getting ready for a tour just a few days after being discharged from the hospital. Before he was diagnosed, Haggard had experienced frequent coughing fits but didn't realize that it was a sign of something more severe and persisted with his shows. I always felt better after I'd work because of the exercise that it gave to my lungs. When I play, I feel better when I come off. Haggard was finally forced to go to the hospital after he felt like he was suffocating before a performance. He said the experience was terrible. Doctors described his pneumonia, which had affected both lungs, as, quote, about the size of a grapefruit on each side. The singer managed to beat it, though, and was ready to get back to touring within weeks. Merle Haggard wasn't a simple man, and he wasn't a simple icon either. He once said, It never has been fun being Merle Haggard. I've had lots of peaks and valleys. From his history of theft incarceration, spousal abuse, and addiction, to his complex political beliefs, Haggard lived a controversial and very public life. I'm deeply disturbed with our country and deeply in love with it. But he never shied away from talking about his own faults, and he channeled those complexities into seemingly simple songs that were deceptively deep, and revealed a great deal about the universal human struggle. Haggard passed away on April 6, 2016, his 79th birthday. Fans and musicians around the world expressed their grief and paid their condolences. Dolly Parton, Willie Nelson, and Clint Eastwood were among those who paid public tribute, while Beatles drummer Ringo Starr tweeted, God bless Merle Haggard. Peace and love to all his family. Merle was a hero of mine. Peace and love. Perhaps Haggard himself gave the best eulogy, saying in an old interview, there is a restlessness in my soul that I've never conquered, not with motion, marriages, or meaning. It's still there to a degree, and it will be till the day I die.